Good afternoon, everyone. The Faculty Senate will now come to order. We have a quorum. There is refreshments in the back. They came to us a little bit late because of traffic, so please help yourself to refreshments um, as needed. Um, if you um, have not already done so, please make sure you check into um, the Seaboard mobile app. Um, and if you're having trouble, we have somebody here from technology to help us today as well. So please go ahead and check in. Um, we do have a quorum already though, so thank you to those that have already checked in. I will now check in with our colleagues at Potomac State and WVU Tech. Potomac State, how many senators do you have? We have three present. And WVU Tech? We have two pre senators present. Thank you. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started. The first thing on our agenda is to approve the minutes from last faculty senate meeting that took place on January 13th. Those have been distributed um, as part of your, as an annex to part of your agenda. Are there any corrections to the minutes from the, from the January meeting? Potomac State, do you have any corrections? Uh, no corrections. And Tech, do you have any corrections? No corrections. Okay, hearing there are no corrections, the minutes from January's meeting are approved as written. And with no further ado, we'll have a report from President Key. Good afternoon, everyone. Come on, good afternoon. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a dreary day. I know it is that, as a matter of fact. Emma, you run a tight ship. You really do. It was right at 3.15. I didn't even have time to get a cookie. So I'm, uh, I'm feeling put upon, as a matter of fact. So uh, we are halfway through the legislative session. No harm yet. Um, but let, uh, but let me just say that it, it is a slow session. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a year for elections, as you well know. And so um, the governor's budget, and I believe that the, the legislature is going to support that uh, we have a flat budget, which is better than some that we have had for some time, uh, continue to give us some flexibility. One of the things that um, we have been working on, which we worked on through this Blue Ribbon Commission last year and now, this year is developing a real funding formula for stability of our institution. And we now have significant uh, support for that, which is something, David, as you know, which is something that we wanted to do for some time. It's been, um, and it will, it will differentiate among institutions and it will also, uh, it will also be helpful for performance. So we, we think it's important for, if we perform well to get rewarded for doing so. So those are two things that we think are enormously important and, uh, and we're grateful for that. And um, I know the provost will have a number of things to, uh, to talk about, but I wanted to make certain that uh, you knew that. In addition, uh, I will say that, um, you know, we had the campus carry bill last year. I think that uh, we, we feel that it is not going to, it has been introduced, but we do not believe there's a lot of political support for it. So we think that we're in, in good shape this year. Um, and in fact, I think it's lost a lot of steam as it has um, nationally at this point. So we're grateful, for, uh, we're grateful for that. And then just in terms of general issues at the university, I'll just say that one of the things I wanna have all of you think about, uh, which is something that I'm trying to think about a lot, and that is um, what I would call, um, how, do we look at the, how do we look at the world in, in 20 years? Um, I know that that sounds a little exotic, but uh, if you think about it, um, and if it is true that artificial, um, that artificial intelligence is going to replace a lot of us, and I'm not being uh, facetious about that, they estimate up to, um, in the next 15 years, up to about 80% of the jobs will be replaced by artificial intelligence. And the question is, are we training people for obsolescence? And what are we doing to make certain that we are very creative, that we are, that uh, universities are places in which um, we are on the front end of ideas rather than trying to respond to, to what is happening. Uh, many of you know I don't believe in strategic planning because I think by the time we plan, we've lost. Uh, I think that we have to be very action oriented and, I, and, and I'm certain that uh, the provost will talk a little bit more about that. But I just want to challenge you um, in a, sort of a dreary day, not to, because I'm not gloomy at all, but I do want to challenge all of us to think about what will the world look like in 15, 20 years, and how do we um, think about the world now as it will be then, and how do we um, then restructure the university to be compatible with that? And uh, I think that that's an important question for all of us. Saying that, I'm really open for questions today. Any questions? 
I am grateful for no question. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. What about my friends uh, in our two institutions? Any questions? No, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appropriately ignored. Well, I, have, then there I have a question. Yes. So I'll, I'll ask President Gee a question. So you've challenged us to think about how we will look at the university in the world in 20 years. What are, your, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind? Well, you know, obviously I wouldn't have asked that question if I didn't think about it. And by the way, you're not my foil here. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to know that. Uh, well, I, I, I think that uh, the way that I think about it is that uh, I, I think that the role of our university needs to, needs to be one of what, how we differentiate ourselves and how do we create programs that are, um, that are very cross uh, transinstitutional. Think about, think about the success we've had with, uh, with, I'll just point three different programs, obviously forensic science, which is the best in the country. Uh, I think about our new neural science program, which uh, is quickly becoming one of the really significant signature programs of the institution. Um, and then uh, I think about uh, I, I think about a couple of other programs, uh, astrophysics. Our 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 our, our folks in uh, in um, in physics are doing a tremendous job. Joan Centrella, who really was one of the architects of the Mars mission, is now with us, as you know. And uh, and she came here because she wanted to be at a place which was thinking forward, and she believes that we are that. So it's not as if we are not doing it. But it is um, an issue for us. To think. So, so I would say that the three things is we need to, we need to pick bets that are important. We need to we need to make certain that we have institutional programs that uh, that go across the uh, the landscape of the institution. And the third thing is the fact that we need to take a look very carefully at um, at areas in which we can be better than anyone else, and we can. Uh, you know, sometimes we want to be good at everything and not good enough. To do some of the things we should be doing, so that's that's where I see us. I'm very optimistic about where where we can be. I do think we need to move forward as quickly as we can. Thanks, Emily. Everyone have a great day. Okay. And now we will have a report from Provost Reed. Good afternoon. Thank you. So last time I was here, I said that we would um, that I would be able to announce the, the new Dean of Statler, the Statler College by the end of January, I'm sorry, on February 1st, um, we rolled out, uh, we made the announcement that uh, we have hired Dr. Pedro Mago uh, as the new chair of the Statler College. Dr. Mago is a department chair and a name chair at Mississippi State University. He comes highly recommended. He's very excited about coming here and we are already talking about the transition uh, with him. And I wanna thank all the faculty, particularly the faculty in the Statler College who were so engaged in the search um, and brought us a really good candidate. So um, that's good news. We uh, currently, uh, we have the other two searches that are underway right now are the Davis College and Extension Service. And uh, we've conducted airport interviews for both searches. Um, we are finished with those. And so now it's a question of, whittling down that those two lists to the the smaller group of faculty or excuse me of uh, dean candidates who will come to campus up uh, in early march so we'll we'll be announcing those visits uh fairly soon but right now we're uh continuing to do some of the background checks and uh and whittling down those lists so it's very exciting and and uh, some strong candidates in both of those searches i am pleased to report we are continuing to place a laser focus on student retention and persistence. And uh, so first of all, I wanna share some good news that our graduation rates are up. Our four-year graduation rate of the uh, 2013 cohort increased from 36 to 39%. Still doesn't sound that great, huh? Um, our five-year rate is up from 54 to 59%, and our six-year graduation rate is up from 59 to 60%. Still not ideal, but it is at least two points above a national average. Our work, however, is far from done. We are just beginning. Last month, I brought a team of uh, faculty and administrators to Georgia State University, which has become the national leader in student success. It was an incredible visit. Um, we, we gained some or we learned something about practical applications that we can do, some of which we're doing already, some of which we can emulate. But I have to say that the trip was 
not just informational, it was inspirational. At Georgia State, which is a different, slightly different university than ours, they're not a research uh, university, but at, at Georgia State, student success is becoming an enormous part of their culture and their brand. At all levels of the institution, people are buying into to student success, not just as a way to generate more revenue, but as a truly noble mission. They're making college completion possible for a population that is, is disadvantaged. And in fact, the, the population at Georgia State University isn't that much different than ours. 25% of our students are Pell Grant eligible, which means they have very little that they can contribute to college. 29% of our students are first generation. 40% of our in-state students are first generation. So we too are dealing with students uh, for whom college can be a real challenge. So student success will continue to be a major focus uh, for, for our university. We are continuing to roll out initiatives that are related to student retention and success. You'll hear about a couple of those today uh, from our consultant that we're working with, Torchstar. But in addition, we are developing a long-term strategy so that we can significantly move the needle. And there'll be things that we'll be doing at the institutional level, but there will also be things that we will ask you to do as faculty because you are on the front lines of students' academic success. And so you'll be hearing a lot more about that, some of it today and, and some um, as the months continue. Partly as a retention effort, this summer the university will be piloting a May semester. This will be a three-week condensed term that is similar to our winter session, and it will run from May 11th to May 29th. You are hearing it first today. The goal is to capture students before they leave for the, for the summer and perhaps create a new audience for summer programming. And in fact, we've had a decline in our summer enrollments um, in recent years. So this may be a way to revive interest in summer school. And we think it might be more attractive to faculty because it is a shorter term and it would leave open for some of you the rest of the summer. As with the winter session, we plan to charge a flat tuition rate that will make it more attractive and affordable for students. Uh, but I do wanna tell you, this is just a pilot. We are gonna start out with a small cohort of 10 courses, and we wanna test the model to see how students respond to it, and if it's uh, successful, then we can scale it up. And we know we were, we've been very successful with our winter session um, in terms of students' interest and enrollment. In a continued effort to reward and recognize faculty who have alter alternate assi alternative assignments, we are putting forth a proposal to the Board of Governors uh, this month for changes to rules 4.2 and 4.7. The modification to uh, BOG rule 4.2 would allow deans and chairs to offer service track faculty, formerly called clinical faculty, the same three six and nine year contracts that currently exist for teaching faculty. This modification is important because as it currently stands, service professors are given just one year contracts, regardless of their performance or regardless of their length of service to the institution. Once service track faculty are granted longer contracts, they should also be affected by BOG rule 4.7, which is, uh, uh, refers to reduction in force. When a faculty member has a contract that is granted yearly, they don't need to be covered by BOG 4.7, but once they receive longer contracts, they move into the same category as tenured, tenure track and teaching faculty, which means they too will be affected by a reduction in force should that ever come to pass. So the modification to BOG rule 4.7 adds service professors to that list of faculty who will be affected. And so we'll be presenting it to the Board of Governors at the end of the month, and then it will go through the, the process uh, for public comment and so on. In the next week or so, you will uh, also be hearing about a new pilot program to enhance faculty diversity. The Provost Office will be providing seed money to hire up to four new faculty of color this year, ideally an additional four next year and a four, four more after that, so a total of 12 faculty positions. Um, which is a small pilot. We will be providing three years of salary support up to $75,000 for each of those hires. In addition, we will be rolling out an accelerated hiring process that will enable colleges and departments to target specific candidates who will who fill a need in that unit. 
And we uh, just shared a draft of this to our deans and we expect to be sharing this with the wider campus in the next week or two. This will be a competitive process and we will look to where we can make the most impact. A unit that is already a commitment to, to diversity hiring will, will, will move ahead of that competition. And then last but not least, tomorrow we are rolling out a new program that is a direct outcome uh, from last year's strategic transformation process. A small group of faculty, affectionately named the Strategic Transformation Implementation Team, has created a new program called Transform This. This is a mini grants program designed to bring to life the goals and aspirations of the strategic transformation um, visioning process. This spring, the grants program will focus on goal number five, which is be a university that advances a culture, climate, and organizational structure that promotes sustainability, well-being, and an enriched quality of life. Faculty and staff, are, will, both faculty and staff will be encouraged to participate. We will be awarding up to 20 grants of up to $1,500 each. Um, so the details though on that will be released tomorrow. Um, be on the lookout for that message. If you have a great idea for bringing people together, creating community and enhancing our culture, I would encourage you to apply. This is supposed to be fun. So you may come up with some crazy ideas that we think are just really innovative and we'll try them. Uh, this is primarily for the downtown campus because HSC has already started another program and quite frankly, we stole their idea. So that is all from me. Any questions? Any questions from our friends at Potomac State and at Tech? No, ma'am, no questions. Going? Evansdale, Evansdale's included. I, I'm so sorry, I meant the main campus. Thank you. No, 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 absolutely not. That, I'm so sorry, thanks for clarifying. No, it's the main campus, just not health sciences. Thank you. Anything else? Going, going, gone. We will now have a presentation um, by uh, representatives from Torchstar Education. Torchstar Education is a consulting firm focused on the higher education sector. Pre presenting today um, are two Torchstar principals, Sally McMillan and Serena Matsunaga. I may have butchered that name. Um, Sally is a professor and current interim director of the School of Advertising and Public Relations at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. For 10 years, she served in administration at UT, first as an associate dean for academic affairs in the College of Communication and Information, then as vice provost for academic affairs, where she spearheaded efforts that led to a 22% increase in four-year graduation, graduation rate over 10 years. She also has 15 years of experience in advertising and public relations. And Serena is a management consultant focused on higher education. Over the, the past 15 years, she's worked with more than 25 colleges and universities on issues related to strategic planning, student retention, enrollment management, organizational effectiveness, and resource management. As a former director in Huron Consulting Group's higher education practice, Serena led numerous large-scale engagements at top universities. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you today um, on this rainy day. So let me start by uh, just giving you a little bit of an overview. We're going to talk about what it is that we're going to be working on, what the objectives are, talk a little bit about an academic retention roadmap, the process, timeline, and next step. And then at the end, we will take some questions as well. Oops, excuse me. So first, in terms of the objective, we've heard today some numbers about retention and graduation rates. And I know over the past months at Faculty Senate, you've been hearing about the imperative of improving retention rates as a way to manage enrollment and resources. These are very important uh, factors. And also to address areas of challenge for students. So, what we are going to talk with you some about today is some work that we've already done here at uh, West Virginia University, a process that we call STAY, and we'll talk to you more about that, give you an overview of it, and also look at some of the things that have already been happening here at WVU in terms of some changes that have been made, specifically around two major issues. Um, 
One is high fail rate courses, those in which students earn a D, an F, or they withdraw, and also uh, looking at course scheduling. So the STAY. This is a tool that we deployed in um, May of last year, just a little less than a year ago. We engaged with more than a thousand of your students who had achieved um, nine hours or more of coursework. So these are students who, by definition, are seniors. These are students who stayed, hence the name. Um, we want to understand why they stayed. But we also want to understand a little bit about contemplation. One of the things that we've learned at other institutions is that some students who stay until their senior year actually go through a process of seriously considering leaving. And what we learn from those students can be very helpful in thinking about what was it that, that transformed them from a contemplator into a stare. We also looked a little bit at some data that you folks had already done about students who leave and then also looking at students who come back. So all of those populations. We wanted to get an understanding from the students of what their roadblocks were, their challenges, and also of what works. That's an important piece of this. And then we did a little bit of an additional breakdown of Pell eligible students. The full study is um, long. We're not going to take you through all of it. Just want to highlight a few things that help to show why we're focusing on the things that we're focusing on now. So quickly, this is a profile of the students who participated in the study. Um, without getting into a lot of detail, I realize some of those numbers may be a little hard to read from the back, but I believe this slide deck is available to you. In general, the population is fairly similar to the overall population um, here at, at WVU. A couple of insights. One, um, high school preparation is a challenge for some of your students. I know that this is not um, news to many of you. But it is important to recognize that this challenge is not the same across your whole student body. So overall, 60% of students felt academically prepared. That means 40% did not feel academically prepared. And remember, these are seniors. These are seniors who are on the verge of graduating. The troubling thing is that your in-state students are um, less likely to feel prepared and your first generation and Pell eligible students even less likely to feel prepared for college. So these are the students you have, perhaps not the students you want, but these are the students you have. And so the challenge is how to help them succeed. So one of the things we asked about was academic challenges. We asked them about a whole series of um, potential academic challenges to find out what may have cause them to consider leaving or even to leave and stop out and come back. And we found that adjusting to academic demands, course scheduling and quality of advising were the three most common things. And in fact, campus scheduling was the thing that's, that was most frequently identified as a challenge among these particular students. And uh, not only was it a challenge, it was also uh, you know, in terms of the percentage of students who perceived it to be a challenge, it was also a challenge in terms of if when we ask about how big of a challenge it was, it was one of the largest. And then for the Pell eligible students, we found that um, adjusting to academic demands continued to be a problem, but academic probation and passing required courses moved into that upper right quadrant of really important factors of what challenged them and led them either to stop out or to consider stopping out. So at this point, I'm going to turn over to Serena to talk a little bit about some of the things you're already working on. Yeah, so as we start to think about action, you know, what are we going to do to move retention rates based on some of the feedback for students? We're going to build on recent wins. You've done a lot here at WV you should be proud of over the last semester or so. And a lot is coming in, in course scheduling. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the team we're working with. So it's led by Evan Witters and Joe Seaman. Um, we're working with Kimberly Barnes, Natalie Singh Corcoran, Rebel Smith, and Valerie Lassinger. And um, we also have Liz Reynolds joining the team. So as you can see, we're, it's, a, it's a team that is um, focused on folks who are, are really active in doing the work here at WVU. So, um, we're working with your academic leadership and those in the trenches of the, in, in the front lines of course scheduling and, and some of the CSW um, activity. 
but to be, you know, and under their leadership, um, already you've seen some changes. So there's been a change in the repeat policy. So previously students could repeat unlimited times and now you have contained that to repeating only three times. That's gonna be um, a significant win in course availability down the line. You've decoupled le lectures and labs in biology and chemistry. That should lead to more, more seats. Um, you've done midterm grades and progress reporting. And sometimes this is, is rather controversial to get started to implement and you've done it really well. So what we're gonna do is start to move on these wins that have, uh, have already been um, implemented here at WVU. Uh, we're not stopping there though. This team has already teed up some action for fall 2020 and beyond. So um, thinking about registration. So preventing registration of multiple sections of the same course. Again, creating more seats down the line. STEM schedule, so thinking through a core schedule for math, chemistry, and biology to help schedule some of the, um, the high, the, the major courses that, that, that depend on these, these three courses. Um, guided pathways, so thinking about how to progress in a major um, may not be your first choice of major, but, but what are the options within sort of family of majors? Tutoring upgrades, an academic support council to advise on, on improvements in the, the, the approach to tutoring. And then starting to think through registration waitlist. And this is, gonna be, this is gonna start in fall. It's not necessarily gonna be implemented in fall, but how do you start to automate the process of letting students know when seats are available? Again, this is a lot of activity and we can credit Valerie and her team for getting the analysis and the activity as a foundation to move forward. So again, these are the things that have already been done and already planned. Uh, where we wanna go from here is, well, let me just go back and, and, and say that based on this, again, more seats available in high demand courses addressing the top challenge that students say, say were, was an academic roadblock, so this course scheduling availability of courses. But now you have new opportunities for intervention and proactive advising because you have more midterm grades, you have more sort of progress reporting and um, some of the guided pathways work is gonna allow the advisors to help students along, um, especially early on in, that, in their career. So where we wanna go here is um, we're, we're gonna start to take a look, um, not only at the course scheduling data that you've already looked at, but we're gonna look at your DFW data and start to prioritize where the, where the, the, the areas of high impact are. You know, what are the courses that are causing some bottlenecks and roadblocks? And, um, again, this is, there's no um, easy solution here. We recognize that you have done a lot of work here and we're not trying to duplicate this work. We're trying to again, build on what you've done in course scheduling and start to bring this together with DFWs to start to think about um, the academic roadmap more systemically. Um, we're going to incorporate some of the students' perspective, the voices that we heard from the students about where their challenges are. And then we're gonna do um, a profile of case studies from peers. So we're not gonna only look, we're not gonna look at aspirational institutions only, but some of the peers that are relatively similar, comparable to your student profile and some of the outcomes to say, okay, these are the things that are happening within the discipline and in higher education on DFW courses and course scheduling. Um, not necessarily borrowing from others, but to say, these are, these are things to think about. And so once we get this sort of profile together of where we should focus, of what the students are saying and what others are doing, we're gonna come together and build a roadmap that will allow for consistency. Because this, this is an overnight change. There's nothing, there's not a lot of silver bullets here. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring the deans, department heads and faculty together to collectively develop an action plan um, and start to think about a longer term timeline because you know, frequent changes sometimes can lead to change fatigue. And I'm sure some of you have already experienced this. So how can we develop a course over multi years to address these issues and then start to think about implementation um, and how to really start to have some discipline around communication and um, measuring success to, to, to support this effort. So, Again, we're introducing this process. We will be back in the April, May timeframe with more substance for you. But um, we wanted to let you know that this is going on and who's involved in case you have some ideas. 
Um, again, let me, let me give you the names of the committee members. It's again, Joe Seaman, Evan Witters, Kimberly Barnes, um, Natalie Singh Corcoran, Rebel Smith, and Valerie Lassinger. Um, and from February to April, we, we will be sort of doing the data review, the case studies, and integrating the student perspectives. And then in, in April, May, we will bring this together for the action plan and opportunities for engagement. And we're targeting June 2020 to start implementation so that we, the work should be done in June 2020. We look forward to working with you. It's, it's, it's been um, wonderful to already work with you on this day. We've had some great committee meetings and we're really impressed with what you've already done with scheduling. So we think that there's a solid foundation for this. Um, with that, any questions? Question back there? Oh, okay, now, now the questions are coming. <laughs> Do you wanna to come to the mic? I, is there? Okay. There are mics here on the side. Hi, I'm Lori Andrus, Chair of the Senate Faculty Committee on Inclusion. I noticed that your data did not reflect any racial ethnic breakout in it. And I'm wondering if you can do something about that, either oversample or create a particular focus group of racial and ethnic students who give you feedback as you go through this process. Um, and I'm also wondering about adding a racial ethnic representative on the faculty group. Yes, um, so I think that what we have is a data set that we, we can do some of that segmenting. Um, and I'm sure we could accommodate an additional faculty member on the committee. So thank you. Yes, and, and as I mentioned at the start, this is just a very brief report um, and we do have data on racial and ethnic breakdown. We just didn't report it here today. Another question? Could you go for the Okay. <laughs> I'm Peter Shea for in Davis College. I just want to ask you, where can we get a hold of your slides on the web pages? We presented in the fall, so I think we could post that. The the pre presentation. Okay. Oh, there's more questions. Yeah, okay. I have another question. I'm Vicki Seely from Eberly uh, Math Department. Uh -huh. And I know that a lot of the changes that have already been made for course scheduling have been for the 100 level courses. But if I remember correctly, your data was from seniors that are having trouble scheduling. So can you talk a little bit about what scheduling problems the seniors were having? So um, the fact that they were seniors and reporting course scheduling didn't necessarily mean that that course scheduling was happening when they were seniors. We asked them for things that had been challenges to them at any time during their career. So we did not break that out by specific course, um, but that's the kind of thing that we'd like over the next couple, three months to really sort of dig into and get a better understanding of what are the real problems? Um, what, where are the areas where students are struggling with getting the classes that they need? And we welcome suggestions for um, how to do that most effectively. Hi, I'm Ruchi Bhandari and I have um, two questions. One, um, how was your sample chosen? You had 1,095 students. So was it basically convenient sampling? Like you offered the questionnaire to everyone and whoever responded, or did you actually have a strategy to select them? And okay. I can ask the second one later. Uh, the, the answer to your first one is it was a convenient sample. It was sent to all students who met that criteria of having nine credit hours or more. Okay, okay. And then uh, somewhere on your slide you had, um, that um, how many students felt prepared when they entered WVU, right? So from high school. So then are we thinking of something like a bridge semester or a bridge program to get them at par so that then we can continue with our courses? The short answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> um, and you know, specifically, we were asked to come and look at DFW and, and course scheduling issues. But you know, I think that's an interesting question and one that you might take up with your academic affairs leaders. 
Yeah, let me add to that. So I think from the process, we'll be what I call, we're going to do the homework phase first. So, and then we're going to do sort of the action planning solution phase. So it might, it may be, it's, um, it's part of the process to start with a blank slate and kind of let the data, the student voices and sort of the peer benchmarking inform where we're going to go. But that's an, again, that's an excellent suggestion and maybe one for that April, May timeframe. Thank you. I think, okay, we have one more. And then um, if there's questions from Potomac State or Tech, um, please let us know. Hi, Vijay from uh, Statler College. Uh, my question is, have you looked at discipline uh, specific statistic, uh, like maybe science-based, math-based, engineering-based, or health sciences, and do they get stuck in the uh, basic math science related uh, courses or would it be at the upper level, maybe design courses or uh, uh, so, so maybe that distinction may also help uh, to uh, kind of address some of these uh, uh, rates. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we will be breaking it down by discipline as we start to think about not only your institutional data, um, but depending on what we see, we may end up looking by just you know, thinking through discipline level opportunities as we look at some of the case studies. And the yeah. reason I say is there may be opportunity to move them parallelly or laterally and then have uh, even better success rate and also the retention rate may go yes. up. Thank Great. you. Thank you. All right, questions from <clears throat> Tech or Potomac State? No questions at WVU Tech. No questions from Kaiser. Well, thank you for this time, and we look forward to uh, re-engaging you sometime later this spring. And we'll now have our curriculum committee report from Ed. Ed there you are. <laughs> Hello, oh. everyone. I have for your approval Annexes 1, 2, and 3. Annex 1 is uh, new courses. We have a little over 40. Annex 2, uh, course changes. And Annex 3, uh, capstone report. And I also have for you uh, change to the AOE to major in Russian uh, studies and uh, changes to the major in public health. Are there any questions or points of discussion for Ed and the curriculum committee? Okay. From Potomac State or Tech? No. All right, so we have five approval items. So we're gonna combine all the approval items into a single votable item, unless there are any objections to do, doing so. Okay, um, all those in favor of approving um, the annexes one through three and the changes to the major in public health and the change of AOE to a major in Russian studies, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. Potomac State. Potomac State, four I. And Tech. WVU Tech, two I's. The I's have it in annexes one through three and the changes in the major of public health and the change of um, AOE to major in Russian studies are approved. And I skipped an agenda item. I was getting a little anxious to get through, but um, yeah. so I'm going to be really brief. And so I skipped my report to you all. Um, I'm going to be very brief because we do have a full agenda. So I was just getting ahead of myself. Um, last week, you should have received an email from the provost, uh, provost office soliciting, soliciting your feedback related to E News and WV Weekly. Um, HR or you are reached out to me and just wanted me to encourage you to please. Um, complete that sh short Qualtrics survey related to eNews and WV Weekly so they can um, improve or change it to meet our needs as faculty and staff. Um, at our March faculty Senate meeting, we will have um, a presentation from BJ Davison from the foundation. Um, in addition, at the March meeting, we will also be taking nominations for faculty Senate chair elect. Um, this is also the year that that person who will be elected will also serve on the Board of Governors um, in 2022 and 2023. So given that, does anybody have any questions for me? All right, and then Leslie with Jeffco report. We have no report for this month. Sorry, very odd to have a question on a non-item, uh, but I do have a question from Eberly, uh, Burt McCusker, Eberly College. 
So we have informally heard that there's a task force that has been formed on this issue. Um, is that A, is that correct? And then B, how's that formed? And C, can faculty have input into that? So I am going to call up Evan Witters to answer that very insightful question. So the question was, um, you heard, I'm sorry, you heard there was a task force and what was the exact question? So I apologize. Is, so is, is there a task force on this? Who comprises it? How, how is the task force formed? And then can, what's the process for faculty, general faculty input into the task force if there is a task force? Okay, great question. So the Jeff task force, we formed it because there was, well, we wanted more uh, sort of, Jeff, general education is such a big project. We really wanted more input from different areas of the university. So when we started the task force, we looked for representation from every academic unit and not little unit, but larger unit, college, school, in the university. Um, also, we needed representation for financial aid. We need representation for the registrar, people on the implementation end of the project. And then we also added um, some faculty senate representation, student government representation. So what we've ended up with is uh, about 30 members on the task force, uh, most of which two thirds about are faculty. Um, the faculty were nominated by their academic deans or their deans, uh, their unit deans. Let's see, that got one. Will there be um, comment period for faculty? Was that another one? Absolutely. Uh, this will come through Senate. The whole process will come through Senate. We will um, have Senate, you know, vote uh, on their approval of the process. So, yeah, it's, it's not anything that we're, you know, intending to do without having full input from as many faculty as we can get. We'll also have a comment section um, and then have people, you know, put in whatever their thoughts are on the process. Yes. Am I forgetting someone? Chairs. Chairs. Oh, yeah. Um, what about chairs? Oh, who the chairs are? I'm a chair. Paul's a chair and Dave. Um, Dave, you here? Dave's a chair. Uh, so that's Dave Hauser. Sorry, Dave Hauser's a chair. That's the uh, co-chair set up for it. Um, but then, as I said, there's, you know, 27 other people who are on the committee task force. So what's the charge of the task force? The exact charge was sent to the prospective members, um, but basically it had to do with looking at gen ed um, in terms of, you know, what would best serve students. Uh, one of the big uh, impetus for this movement is to get gen ed more in place with where we're going with Title IV and financial aid compliance. So we really want gen ed to be something that students are able to participate in why having those credits paid for um, by financial aid and the promise. Now, it's not that they wouldn't have paid for gen ed in the first place, but we're really looking for an inclusive gen ed that will allow people to do other things like study abroad, have an internship, um, learn a foreign language, and if they choose to have those paid for for federal aid, if possible. Uh, we, we haven't had the federal aid discussion yet, but it's clear that there'll be new challenges to making sure that students have all their credits covered by federal and state aid. And we really wanna make sure that gen ed meshes, not only with, um, with, with that, but also that you can continue to have the same sort of curriculum that you have now, but also make sure that students are getting as many credits as possible covered by financial aid. Chris? Thanks, Evan. Uh, Chris Pline, Eberly College. Um, a question that has come to me as a senator is, um, what is the timeline of the task force and its work? Oh, what a great question. I don't know exactly. It's a 30 person task force, uh, which I hesitate to say may not move all that quickly. Um, the idea here is really to be more inclusive than to worry about setting a strict timeline. We wanna make sure that we have a final project that product that everyone can live with really more concerned with that than, than getting it through speedy. I mean, you know that, that changing jet ed is, is really like turning a battleship, right? Um, it just, it takes a while. You have to get a lot of buy-in. We want to make sure we have all that before we go forward with it. So, you know, if I had to guess, it, it's definitely not this year. It's probably not next year. So maybe we're looking at fall 22. Um, that would be probably the time frame we'll be looking at. 
this isn't anything I think any of us want to rush. Any other questions? So you'll be hearing a lot more about this. Um, as I said, we're trying to build as inclusive pro uh, process as possible. A lot of people on the committee, um, this will be out in the open and you'll be hearing about it a lot as we move forward. Um, we, we do want to have all the major stakeholders involved in how this turns out. I mean, most of the classes are offered by particular areas in the university, but everyone's students are impacted by gen ed, right? Everyone takes these courses. And just speaking for myself, Really, the, the thing I want to make, you know, I want to be most assured of is that we have really quality courses. In my opinion, not that we don't now, but if, you, if you're telling a student that they have to take something, it really should be the best we can offer them. Um, the, so, you know, the, the process to get into gen ed may change a little bit. I don't know, but we want to make sure those courses are really good courses taught by really invested professors that have really strong learning outcomes so we can assess them and make sure they're doing a good job. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Just really quickly, are there any questions from Potomac State or Tech from, about the Gen Ed Task Force? No questions from Kaiser. WVU Tech has no questions. Thank you for that, Evan. We will now have our report from <coughs> Ashley Sowards and the TACO committee. So we don't have an actual formal report. Um, we do have a new working group that's working on midterm assessment and we'll update the Senate um, regularly on that, but no formal report this time. Anybody have any questions for Ashley? All right, Leslie, you're back up with committee on committee. So we have an annex that we'd like to propose or submit for approval. Um, and particularly adding one individual to one of our standing committees. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Leslie? All right, um, <clears throat> those in favor of approving Annex 4, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. Potomac State, how do you vote? Potomac State, three aye. And Tech, how do you vote? WVU Tech has two eyes. Thank you. We will now have a committee report from Lori Andrus, who's the chair of the Inclusion and Diversity Committee. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to recognize the provost's office for the announcement today on the hiring of the faculty of color. It seems like it's a really great initiative, and we're looking forward to learning more about it. Thank you very much. You had several annexes to look at. And basically our committee, because it's a new group, wanted to update you on what we've been doing since we started meeting in August. And essentially we've met every month since August. And some of the um, initiatives that we focused on was finding people that we could work with, groups that we could work with. And so we thought it was important to identify similar interests We've reached out to the Faculty Welfare Committee as well as the TACO Committee uh, based on similar interests. Also, the Council for Women's Concerns has two other subcommittees that we formed alliances with. One is the Campus Climate Subcommittee and the Women of Color Subcommittee. And so kind of circling those groups together, we've identified common interest and set up a couple of initiatives to work on. If you looked at part of that annex, we listed some activities that we've been pursuing and um, briefly in order, they focus on campus climate assessments, faculty classroom assessments, um, data analysis. We submitted some tables to you for your interest. Uh, we have launched a pilot reading and lecture series, which we focus on in appendix B of that report. And we are working on some recommendations on contra power with the Council for Women's Concerns. I briefly want to talk about the notion of campus climate assessments. And in that report, we list some best practices that we identified. But if you take those best practices and boil them down to a few specific points, the areas that we want to emphasize really focus on the ideas of dialogue, and transparency and accountability so that we begin as a university to have a common language around climate assessments and what they mean. 
and the need for us to have these kinds of climate assessments so that we can be accountable over time for changes in inclusion and diversity so that it becomes measurable, um, that they be visible and transparent so that people know that they are going on and have an opportunity to participate and that there be an ongoing dialogue between underrepresented groups and the leadership. And so when you look at those best practices that we submitted for you, you'll see that they're expressed a little bit more elaborately, um, but this was my attempt to boil them down to significant key points. The other initiative that I want to talk about briefly is the reading and lecture series that we just launched. And so, um, we sent that announcement out to people we thought would want to form groups in their colleges and we are asking people to report back to us by february the 14th we identified two sets of readings and we're asking people who want to have these reading and lecture series in their colleges to volunteer set up two meetings in their colleges convene the groups go through the two readings. We put together a packet of questions. We're asking people to take notes um, and formalize what is discussed in those groups and send it back to us. And we will report that back out. So we view this both as a pilot and as a very minor form of assessment to kind of take the temperature of what's going on in our colleges and the way faculty are thinking about issues of inclusion and diversity. We think again of this as a pilot and we're hoping in the next year to expand it so that we have more groups and that we also bring in speakers. And the goal is to tie the readings to the speakers so that we have a total package that focuses on a series of themes and that it's related co consistently throughout the readings and the speakers. So again, um, if anybody's interested in that reading and lecture series, please get back to us. We'd love to have some volunteers who want to do that kind of um, activity in your colleges. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. <clears throat> so annexes <clears throat> five and six are, um, are, are filed. Um, our committee reports will be approved at the end of the year when they're in their final format. <clears throat> and now we will have a report um, from Roy, Roy Nutter, our um, representative to state government. <clears throat> Roy Nutter, Stetler College, and your ACF, Advisory Council of Faculty Representative and Faculty Representative to State Government. Um, Dave Hauser and I spent all day Thursday in Charleston uh, with 17 other members from other state schools going pretty much door to door. We met with the uh, President of the Senate. We met with the chair of the Senate Education Committee. We met with the House, chair of the House Education Committee, chair of the House Finance Committee, and the House Majority Whip. To a person, the biggest concern coming from them was funding formula. They wanna know how they should allocate money for the four-year and two-year schools in West Virginia. And if, we, if you remember what happened was last year, pretty sure it was just last year, HEPC presented a funding formula that did a real good job on number of graduates, retention rates, things like that, but did not take into account WVU's things like research, extension, medical, none of that. So they are just chomping at the bit to receive this funding formula. And I think to a person, they said, we're waiting on HEPC to present the new funding formula. They did not say they're waiting on WVU, they're waiting on HEPC. So we need to make sure, and I think the president has already said this, that funding formula has, has been presented or is close. But I think as faculty, we need to pay attention to that. So whenever you see funding formula, make sure you read it. Dave, you got anything to add to that? Thank David for going. He uh, kept us all awake <laughs> down there. <clears throat> Questions? 
Any questions for Roy? <clears throat> if not, one more thing. I laid a stack of these uh, advertising brochures for ACF. If you're really dying to know what ACF does, there's a bunch back on the table. Help yourself. I don't want to carry them back. Thank you, Roy. And now we'll have a report from Stan Hellman, our Board of Governors representative. Uh, the board had a special meeting on January 24th, and we really, uh, the two major things that were done were both in some ways money-saving measures. Uh, we amended the contract with Morgantown Energy Associates to allow uh, the use of natural gas as, a, as an energy source uh, for that plant down there and got away from using coal waste in that, in that regard. Um, the second thing was that we approved refinancing several series of bonds to take advantage of lower interest rates. Uh, even though that won't extend the period of indebtedness, it will also it will save literally millions of dollars in terms of, of money spent on those. The hope is that those some of that at least will go into supplementing pay raises and new academic programming and, and uh, re recruiting opportunities and things like that. Um, we also approved two new majors. One was a Bachelor of Sciences degree in Health Services Management and Leadership in the School of Public Health and a Bachelor of Science in Music and Health in the College of Creative Arts, and both of those will be available in the fall. Uh, our next Board of Governors meeting will be February 28th. That will be a regular meeting. Thank you. Stan, does anybody have any questions for Stan? Great. All right, we will now have um, a, a discussion item. Um, Presha Niedermeyer, the Associate Provost for Academic Personnel, is here to discuss the new changes to the Board of Governors rules, which Provost Reed mentioned in her report to us. That's okay. Presha, would you mind going to, either coming up here or going to a mic? <laughs> does, so, um, does anyone have any questions related to the Board of Governors Rule 4.2 or 4.7 that Provost Reed mentioned in her report to us earlier? Thank you. All right. Tech or Potomac State, do you have any questions? No questions from Potomac State. No questions from WVU Tech. All right, thank you. Now we are going to have a presentation regarding plus and minus grading from Lena Maynard. Okay, so my name is Lena Maynard and I was faculty senate chair in the 2016-17 year. And this is going to feel very familiar. Um, that year we looked at plus minus grading as a small work group um, based on a, a request originally made uh, by the Student Government Association. Um, in 2017, uh, Faculty Senate recommended using plus minus grading uh, as part of GPA calculation. And with that recommendation, um, I recommended an implementation, implementation date of 2021 um, because of technology changes that were gonna have to be required to move forward with that, as well as to allow all the students who are currently here to graduate because if we go to plus minus grading, it's an all or nothing switch. And so there was going to be a situation where at one point we were going to calculate pluses and minuses and everything moving forward would be calculated that way and everything moving or everything previously assigned would not be calculated um, with the new type of calculation. Um, this is some estimated uh, aggregate impact uh, information. This is based on fall semester 2018 and is also based on the assumption that grading patterns would stay as they are now. So the same number of pluses and minuses now versus what it would be in the future. Um, so you can see that the average overall GPA does not change very much um, in that proposed model and uh, neither does the median GPA. Based on that same data, it's estimated that GPA would not change for about 55% of students. 13% would see a GPA increase and 32% would see their GPA decrease. If you look at that almost a third of students who are gonna have the GPA decrease, so that's what the table is. The table is that third of students who are gonna see their GPA decrease. Um, there are some threshold points that some of those students will drop below. So 7% of that cohort, which is a little over 400 students would no longer be eligible for the Promise Scholarship. 
Um, probably worth noting that we would be the only school in West Virginia grading on a plus minus scale. So at another public school, student with the same grade history would qualify for the promise. 3% um, or 180 students would lose uh, Title IX financial aid eligibility and would be placed on university suspension. It would also impact any other university or foundation scholarships that have threshold marks. Um, student government has rescinded their request and would actually strongly like to see us not do this. Um, the other thing to consider and one of the reasons for the four year lag time was the complexity of implementation. Um, we now have new initiatives such as the course scheduling that you just heard the presentation about. Um, and some things related to degree pursuant courses and Title IV aid that would have to take a back seat in order to let the technology changes happen for moving forward with plus minus grading. So I think you know where I'm going with this. Um, so the decision's been made <laughs> not to move forward with plus minus grading in 2021. And with that, I am happy to take questions. Are there any questions from Tech or uh, Potomac State? No questions. WVU Tech has no questions. So, hi, Lisa DiBartolomeo, Everly College. Uh, basically, this is to fix the mistake that we made a few years ago. I think a lot of us said, oh, the student government wants us to do this, we should do this, without necessarily thinking of the long term consequences. And once it became clear that this would actually hurt a significant portion of our students, uh, we, we had a rethink. So uh, I have a motion. <clears throat> in May 2017, Faculty Senate voted to support counting plus or minus grades in GPA for undergraduate students. In light of the fact that Student Government Association has withdrawn its original support for the proposal to count plus or minus grades, in the GPA for undergraduate students, and in light of the new information shared by the provost's office concerning the detrimental effects of counting plus or minus grades in the GPA for many of our students, Faculty Senate rescinds its vote as reported in May 2017. And I need us, I will need a second. We have a second. All those in favor. Oh, discussion. Oh, discussion. Are there any questions or points of discussion for Lisa's motion? Who has had a second from Scott? Okay. Potomac State or Tech, do you have any questions regarding the motion? No questions in regards to the favor from Potomac State. No questions at WBU Tech. So um, all those in favor of approving the motion to kind of rescind a faculty senate vote on implementing plus and minus grades. So just kind of going along with the fact that we will not be doing so. Please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. Potomac State, how do you vote? Three aye. And Tech? WU Tech has two ayes. All right. Thank you, Lisa. And I have a second motion then to follow up on the previous motion. I now move to support the provost's office proposal not to count plus or minus grades in the GPA for undergraduate students. Can we have a second to that motion? All right, we have a second. Um, does anybody have any questions or points of discussion for the motion to um, not uh, to go ahead with? not counting plus and minus grades as recommended by the or as the provost office has decided to do any questions from potomac state or tech potomac state no questions wvu tech has no questions all those in favor of supporting the motion to not count plus or minus grades please say aye those opposed please say no Potomac State. Potomac State, three aye. And Tech. WVU Tech has two ayes. Okay. Thank you, Lena. And Lisa. Emily. Oh, oh, Dave, I didn't look to my left. Okay, Dave Hauser. 
given the previous motion, I would then like to move that the Senate request that the provost's office do away with faculty's ability to give plus or minus grades so that we can only give the letter grades that would only be counted in the GPA. Do I have anyone that would second that motion? I have a second. Okay, are there any questions or points of discussion from the audience? This is how faculty senate meetings are supposed to be. <laughs> What's that saying? You open one can of worms, you close another can. Dave, you just opened another can of worms. Uh, it seems to me that this is an issue that requires a lot more discussion and a lot more thought, uh, and is probably not something that we want to embark upon right now today at 4.15 uh, after a long faculty senate meeting. Uh, I would vote to table this motion for now and to consider it in the future. There's a second to table. Okay. So, how much? So, what do I do to? Or, or we could. Or we okay. Could so, send it to are, a we are going to vote to see if we should table the motion. All in favor of tabling the motion to, for further discussion, please say aye. aye. Those that would like to move forward with the motion, please say no. Okay, so the eyes have it. Um, I need to ask Potomac State and Tech. Potomac State, three I. WBU Tech has two eyes. So at this point, we will table the discussion. Um, may, may I make a friendly amendment? Yes. Which I know there's no such thing, but uh, if, if we could maybe instead of just tabling it, which virtually guarantees its death, maybe uh, move it to a committee That's where it could I was be just, looked at. was uh, just going to suggest. Or... So, Lena, you all had, did you guys have a ad hoc committee that looked at plus minus grading? So, okay, can, can somebody make a motion for that? Uh, I move that uh, TACO uh, investigate the uh, faculty's ability to do away with plus minus grades. We have a motion for a second for that. All right. All those in favor, um, handing over the plus and minus elimination of plus and minus grades over to the discussion for the elimination of plus and minus grades over to TACO, please say, if those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. There's one no. And the Potomac State? Three I to move to TACO. And Tech. WU Tech has two I's. So TACO, you have a new endeavor to look at um, the possibility of looking to eliminate plus and minus grades versus I'm keeping them the same as they are today. Do we have any new business? My name is Nicholas Zag, a first year uh, senator from the Davis College. Um, this is, I'll be brief because I know how late it is. Um, it sounds like Mon County uh, School Board of Education um, has put forth a uh, start of next year's academic calendar um, and is proposed to start on August 20th and WVU starts its fall semester on August 19th, and summer camps um, within the community end on the 14th, when many of us are um, starting for, uh, you know, getting together our, our fall classes. And so several faculty from the Davis College have expressed concern about the lack of coordination between WVU and the Mon County school system. And it's my understanding that like, Charleston maybe sets our calendar. I don't know much about that. Um, there are two public hearings that are coming up on February 25th and March 10th for parents and faculty to can express their concerns and have a couple of questions. Uh, forgive me because I'm new. Maybe this has been previously discussed, um, but there's a question of do WVU and the Mon County school system work together 
to synchronize or at least optimize the academic calendars? Um, how can uh, faculty and staff uh, express their concerns and make sure their needs are being met? And finally, what options are there for WVU to collaborate with the Mon County school systems? Um, the, uh, it was suggested that um, faculty won't return to work uh, during that, that disconnect between the end of the summer camps and the start of the WVU school system. So it seems that this is probably important for us to figure out. Okay, so I'm going to ask May if you would come and either go to a mic. So I will try to, if you wanted to explain, Faculty Senate approves WVU's calendar two years in advance at least. You can please come to the mic because I will probably misspeak. Yes, we um, plan out five years. So each year we start a new <coughs> calendar. There is a calendar committee. And to answer your question, no, we do not work with Mon County at this time. So on behalf of the faculty that expressed their concern, how do we work together because it needs to happen? <laughs> we can bring that up with the calendar committee when we meet again. But as of right now, the, uh, the calendar has been set and has been approved. Thank you. Thanks. Lori? Yes, I wanted to express um, some concern about motions when we assign things to committees. And so it occurs to me that when we assign something to a committee, we might be more specific in that we're assigning it to this committee. They will report back to somebody within some body, B-O-D-Y being the Senate, within 30 days, um, and that they include these groups in that discussion. So that might set more parameters in terms of how issues are handled and that they get worked on and reported back. So in the case of this Mon County WVU example, that could go to faculty welfare. They report back in 30 days and they need to work with some, you know, these groups. But it seems that sometimes when we put issues in places, they sit there with no follow-up. Just a suggestion. Taken. Having previously been on the calendar committee, so this is a little, but we tried this before. Mon County Schools does not set their calendar until right before the beginning of the school year. We can't do that at WVU. We have to have forward planning. So the impetus would be to invite Mon County Schools to participate in the process. We reached out previously, again, old information, tried again, new calendar committee. They declined because they don't set their calendar far enough in advance and they have other old information, try it again. They have other priorities around federal education requirements that they're meeting. So we did try previously, this was a couple of years ago, you can try again, but you have to get them to the table to do this. It's not something that the WVU calendar committee has much control over because of the disconnect between the two institutions. Thank you. All right, is there any other new business? I need a motion to adjourn. Sec second. All right, Faculty Senate is now adjourned. <laughs>